this is a really important issue as the mayor of a, of a city. Uh, cities and towns, uh, the budget is sort of the foundation of what we do in terms of uh, making difficult choices and delivering the key services, and it really speaks to the values, our values as a community. And in recent years, we've struggled with the amount of resources that we've had to work with. I'm really proud that in uh, 2010, I wasn't the mayor, I was still a member of the city council. Uh, we were among one of the first communities in the nation uh, to pass a resolution. Um, it, was a, it was a bring the dollars home resolution, but the principal focus of it was to not only end the war in Afghanistan, support our troops and provide the services to our troops and veterans, but also to reinvest those dollars in things that we need here at home, uh, in our roads, in our public works, in our education, in public safety, uh, social services, et cetera. And so this, this budget for all uh, really follows along in that same vein. And we're really fortunate tonight to have some of our uh, federal and state leaders, as well as uh, um, uh, Joe Comerford from uh, National Priorities Project uh, to talk with us about it. So I want to introduce our moderator uh, for tonight, um, uh, who's going to be uh, introducing the topic and then switching over into the forum, and that's Jeff Napolitano from the American Friends Services Committee. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight, and a particular thank you to May and Arkowitz. Um, we're here to listen and to speak out about an upcoming referendum question, which will be on the ballot here in the Pioneer Valley in Amherst, Granby, Hatfield, Holyoke, Montgomery, Pelham, Northampton, Southampton, and West Hampton, and in nearly two dozen cities and towns in Berkshire County, as well as dozens of cities and towns in the Boston area. The question, in short, asks if you wish to prevent cuts to our fundamental social security, uh, safety net, rather, whether you wish to create and protect jobs through investments in traditional areas like manufacturing, schools, and housing, but also in green, renewable energy, whether you want to provide new revenue through raising taxes on the rich, closing tax loopholes and offshore tax havens, and whether you want to redirect military spending away from the disastrous wars and the bombing that our country does overseas, finally bringing home all of the U.S. troops out of harm's way. These are not merely questions on a ballot, but are in fact the substance of one of the three serious budgets that have been proposed in Washington, D.C. This budget, called the Budget for All, has been put out by the largest congressional caucus, the Progressive Caucus. It calls for doing all of these things that I just listed and doing them better than the other budgets in contention, Representative Ryan's budget and President Obama's budget request. This is not merely a bureaucratic report, but it is a very special thing an idea whose time has come, as Representative Lee had once said. Um, it is a concrete, pragmatic way forward, not a pie-in-the-sky fantasy, but an articulate and quantifiable first step towards a more humane country that puts the needs of people ahead of profit. Our national budget, what all of our tax dollars fund, is a moral document, as Representative Lee said, and it is where our country puts its money where our, its mouth is. Unfortunately, for a long time now, our country has been putting its money towards death and destruction, setting aside social uplift and the needs of our people, and ignoring the ecological disaster that our current way of life has been producing. Dr. King declared over 45 years ago that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual doom. He spoke about this country 45 years ago. Look at this piece of paper, and you can get copies of it in the lobby at the AFSC table. This is the federal budget, 2013. This represents what we spend our money on collectively. It represents the moral document of our country. You can't really discern the education spending from the health and human services, from the agri agricultural budget, from way down there. But I'm sure that you can see the big red stripe, right? Everybody can see this big red part right here. That budget goes to war, the Department of Defense, and nuclear weapons. A slice of it represents the budget for Veterans Affairs, which no one will contest is a worthy and necessary way to spend our money. But the lion's share of this budget, of this 60%, goes towards spiritual doom, in the words of Martin Luther King. And it is time to reverse that trend. 
We have in the audience Paki Wieland, who returned recently from Pakistan and Waziristan, where she went on a peacemaking trip with 40 other US citizens to protest the policy of drone, drone attacks in that region and to visit with the families and the victims of the families um, of their indiscriminate drone attacks. Drones whose optical systems were designed in this very city have been killing people in Pakistan and Waziristan for quite some time. Surely we can agree to spend our tax dollars on saving lives, not ending them. In Springfield on Friday, people came together on Talmadge Drive at the home of the Mendez family, who was being foreclosed upon. Despite their street being littered with empty houses, despite the, the Mendez's family desire and ability to pay rent, and despite a lack of anyone actually interested in living in their home, the bank wanted them out. Now it turns out that we had enough people who sat down, who risked arrest, and who said no, that the bank was compelled to cancel the eviction. But there are hundreds of families in Springfield this year who won't have that same support. Surely if we can find enough money to give hundreds of billions of dollars to banks, we can find money to support the victims of those banks. Surely we can divert a little bit of our national budget towards uplifting those who have fallen behind. So how do we reverse the trend that we're on? Well, the Budget for All campaign started well over a year ago when peace groups from all over the state came together to try to identify how, as separate organizations and coalitions spread across the Commonwealth, to begin to affect the discussion in our country on a national level. And while we recognize that our influence as separate groups is limited, we can at least come together in this state and advance this question, the question of whether we're going to spend our way towards spiritual doom or social uplift. And the question is on the ballot in much of the Pioneer Valley this November, among other places. A vote for the budget for all is a vote for a progressive budget, a budget that begins to turn the ship of the federal budget towards human needs. And it has begun in Massachusetts, and when it passes, it will signal that Massachusetts, the state, wants a better way of life. And we hope it will spread across the country so that we can have a serious, pragmatic conversation in the halls of power in to say to those in Washington that it is time to focus on social uplift, not spiritual doom. We will hear from supporters of our referendum, and then we will have an opportunity for you in the audience to come to the microphones on the floor and be heard. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge the folks before we bring up our next speaker that are, that are here to speak. Um, we have uh, Representative Peter Kokut from Northampton. Representative Alan Story from Amherst. We have Congressman uh, Jim McGovern. Uh, we have City Councilor Aaron Vega. And we have uh, Scott Lagenauer from uh, Berkshire County. He's running for but before we hear from all these folks, we will hear about what the budget for all is and how it differs from the status quo. To do that, we have perhaps the best person possible to lay it out for us. Please welcome Joe Comerford, the executive director. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, and thanks to the organizers of this evening. Uh, you know, when I was coming here, I thought, my goodness, we've been given a great gift, right? We get to witness and be part of democracy. Um, and when, the, when we get to vote on November 6th for this budget, it's going to be because our friends and our neighbors hit the streets with clipboards. Uh, person by person, you all made this happen. So I, my, you know, as an organizer, I, I'm really, truly very grateful. Uh, and I'm also really honored to be in the midst of just absolutely stellar legislators. I mean, really, honored. Okay, um, we're going to do this fairly quickly. Budgets are about four things. They're about how we intend to make the money, how we spend it, the assumptions behind each and every budget that we create. So what will unemployment be? Uh, are we going to give a COLA to our seniors? These are the assumptions that undergird budgets. And then what's our ideology? What do we value? How do we think the world works? So, when President Obama put his blueprint for fiscal year 2013 before the nation, there were competing visions, and Jeff began to tease these out. Uh, House Budget Chair Paul Ryan uh, put out a budget that was a departure to the right, 
uh, from President Obama's blueprint. And the Congressional Progressive Caucus put out the budget for all, which was more of a left budget and certainly more of a progressive view about how the world works. My job tonight is to make us all fall a little bit in love with our federal budget. Uh, and in truth, it, in truth, it's difficult sometimes, and, and I understand that, right? So my colleague Chris Hellman's here with me this evening. So at the National Priorities Project, we love these numbers, and we love understanding them for local people and local communities, such as this wonderful community of Northampton, right? Because we think we're powerful if we connect up the local, state, and national dots. Because in truth, the federal budget is working in our midst every single second. And unless we make those connections, we miss a big part of this conversation, which is one of the greatest gifts of this ballot referendum that you brought before us. So you and I are, this, are really the nation's major bill payers, right? We pay about 80% of all federal revenue through our federal income taxes and our FICA, or payroll taxes. We put that money in to this big, you know, nebulous thing, sometimes too nebulous thing, called the federal budget. And here is the projected blueprint as, um, as articulated by the Obama administration for fiscal year 2013. Uh, and Jeff began to talk a little bit about the, the lopsidedness, according for the budget, to the budget for all. And you'll see that here, military is 20% uh, of the total 2013 blueprint in discretionary spending, it's 57%. So you'll understand, this is the $3.67 trillion of the federal budget, and it's roughly 20%. So why does that matter to Massachusetts? Well, you know, this year, we'll get, you and I, each an average of $5,600 in direct federal spending. That's not including tax breaks. Our state budget, also gets, and this, this quarter represents, it's actually a, a conservative estimate, uh, thanks to Peter, uh, we get about a quarter of our budget just for Medicaid funding alone, right? Um, and when, uh, and Peter and Ellen, I'm sure, will talk about this more, but in fact, when we start to add up everything else that comes into our state from the federal government that makes its ways down to our city and, uh, city and town governments and to our businesses, it looks more like $84 billion. It's an enormous sum. Right? And again, that's, that's you and me every single second, and how we live and, and the things that we value for our family. Okay, so these competing visions, let's outline them a little bit. Here's, a, here's how the budget for all thinks about how we make the money, right? Budget's about these primary first two things, how we make the money, how we're gonna spend the money, right? So the budget for all says, okay, we're gonna end the tax cuts for the wealthiest 2%, that's individuals making more than 200,000, families making more than 250,000, right? That's very similar to the Obama administration. Then it goes a little bit further, right? It says we're going to raise tax rates um, and we're going to bring on five new tax brackets for billionaires and uh, millionaires. Um, we're gonna tax capital gains as ordinary income and we're gonna raise the tax uh, ceiling for Social Security. This is all about increasing the pie, if you will, increasing the amount of money that our federal legislators like Congressman McGovern have at their discretion to spend, right? It goes against the grain of the myth that our nation is broke, right? When we start to look at, at numbers like this, just the tax, new tax brackets and capital gains would mean that over 10 years, this budget for all would increase the revenue pie by $1 trillion. That's just the new taxes. Right? Then in terms of corporations, it actually says, okay, we're gonna stop the preferential treatment for fossil fuel companies, close some other loopholes, um, the Wall Street gaming tax, and imposes a price on carbon emissions. Right? Um, so here are the ways in which the budget for all is thinking about increasing the pie. Then when we look at how the Obama administration and Ryan, Congressman Ryan's budget uh, shape up, we see we see the differences in their assumptions about what's going to work for our nation and the differences between themselves and their ideologies, what they value um, in terms of the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget. Again, so President Obama also wants to see the taxes for the wealthiest, 2%, to sunset, right? We have the opportunity to see them sunset on December 31st of this year um, when those taxes can, can go away. Uh, also closing loopholes 
and is, uh, levies a financial crisis responsibility fee. Uh, Congressman Ryan actually replaces our tax brackets um, uh, and chooses two, 10 and 25%. So he's lowering the bar, and he's also going to lower corporate tax rates from 35% to 25%. Now, the tricky part of uh, Congressman Ryan's vision is that already, because of loopholes, corporations don't pay 35%, right? They pay, on average, depending on the year, 20 to 22%, right? Because they, they're uh, privileged by some uh, givebacks and loopholes. So we're all, if we ratchet that bar down to 25%, we know that it's actually going to go lower. So in Congressman Ryan's vision, the pot uh, with which our legislators, or from which our legislators can dip and draw and prioritize their spending um, diminishes, right? Because he's a small government guy. Um, let's think about the budget for all and jobs, another major concern in our nation still really from the economic crisis. Uh, so in this, uh, this budget really distinguishes itself uh, from the other budgets, 2.9 trillion over 10 years. It does it a couple of different ways, in some direct spending um, and and job stimulus, and then it also makes investment in what's called non-defense discretionary spending. Now, there are two types of discretionary spending, which is just as its name sounds, at the discretion of the President and Congress. So every year, President Obama, since he's been in office, proposes a discretionary spending budget that is known in these two halves, defense and non-defense. So the budget for all says we're going to stimulate jobs by shoring up this non-defense discretionary budget, which are things like spending on education, renewable energy, research and development, affordable housing, community development block grants, and by shoring that up, we stimulate jobs, right? So now, uh, then in Medicare, uh, like President Obama's budget, um, they're seeking administrative efficiencies, right? This is a very big difference between uh, the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget and President Obama's budget and, and Congressman Ryan's budget. So they're seeking some administrative uh, changes and efficiencies that will save money over time, but they're hoping to have those administrative changes um, be born and carry the savings by the corporations, by the insurance providers, whereas uh, Congressman Ryan is looking to actually um, uh, have an impact on the beneficiaries directly. So very, very different in the, the approach. Um, also, the Congressional Progressive Caucus and the Budget for All is going to lower prescription drugs um, by negotiating with drug providers. Um, so, in terms of the Obama administration's budget, also President Obama is proposing $350 billion through job, for job creation, largely through infrastructure. Um, and uh, Congressman Ryan is, again, a different ideology, a different set of assumptions um, he is going to generate economic, or he proposes to generate economic activity through tax cuts and eliminating governmental regulations. And then, uh, of course, the Medicare, uh, President Obama also seeking to make Medicare more efficient. It will save money, so he is talking about cuts, but it's cuts to providers and profit, not to beneficiaries. Uh, Congressman Ryan is talking about a voucher system in 2023 um, that would ultimately private, privatize, go a long way to privatizing Medicare um, and allow and, and uh, making seniors compete for insurance on the private market. Um, so let's think specifically at military. Um, so uh, in these lines, line graphs, the, the red arrow talks, shows uh, where the budget for all is going to come out in 10 years. Um, so the budget for all says we are going to have to reduce core military spending. We're going to have to do that through cuts to nuclear weapons. Um, we're going to have to do that through conventional forces, which we think of that as force structure, the size of our troops, where they're placed, um, and the numbers of troops that, who are in the field. Um, we're, they're also going to make a greater um, investment in the Veterans Administration. Uh, something that the Veterans Administration has been calling for nationally to meet the demand. Um, ending war spending uh, beginning in 2014, so you'll notice if you read the budget for all that they have to increase uh, military budget in 13 to get people out safely, so they're thinking about that. Um, and over 10 years, uh, this budget for all will spend $733 billion less uh, than the Ryan budget and $135 billion less than the Obama budget on core military. Um, 
So, so then, right, so this is how we're going to spend the money. And finally, um, let's think about deficit. So we all care about deficit. It's, it's actually fine to talk about deficit. We want to. We want to leave our children with a healthy, uh, a healthy government, a healthy economy. And one of the things that we have to think about is deficit. It turns out that, um, and debt, the aggregated debt, it turns out that the budget for all um, does fares far better um, with deficit. Um, Ultimately, the red, line, the red arrow is pointing to the budget for all. Uh, it, that's 2022, and the budget for all um, remains in deficit, but not nearly as large in deficit as, for example, uh, the Ryan budget, um, which is struggles because Congressman Ryan maintains a commitment to military spending while cutting, um, uh, cutting taxes. And so his budget does not fare well for our economy, our government, in terms of deficit over time. So um, those are just the snapshots. These are competing visions for the United States, and the budget for all represents uh, a more progressive vision for our nation. So thank you. So next, I would like to bring up um, Scott Loganauer, who uh, is running in Berks uh, Fourth Berkshire County, uh, Fourth Berkshire District. I'm sorry uh, for state rep, but. Uh, most significantly, it is worth noting that he and Pat Solomon from Peace Action, just the two of them, um, were able to get the budget for all question on the ballot in 20 Berkshire County cities and towns. So Good evening, I'm Scott Loganauer, and yes, I'm delighted that budget for all is on the ballot in the 4th Berkshire District. Um, I'm running as a Green Rainbow Party candidate for state representative, and I began this year speaking to voters about our state tax and state budget, the unfair tax system in our state, and the unfair budgets in our state budget. And a number of people said, well, yes, just like the federal government, and I said, yes, it is kind of uh, the same. We have the same issues in both. Uh, so how easy it was when I got the tweet from Cole Harrison of Massachusetts Peaks uh, network. I think I didn't even follow Cole at the time. It was retweeted by somebody else that said, hey, there's a budget for all question to address the federal budget. Uh, I had already secured my ballot line, uh, but I thought it was very important, both as part of my campaign and, uh, and everything else, to give voters in the 4th Berkshire District a, a choice. So when we gathered the signatures and we talked about the, the budget issues at the federal government, that mirrors what I talk about at the state government. Uh, people responded extremely favorably, and we learned, when they learned that in November they could vote for a state rep representative who was going to be loud on the issue of fair taxes and fair budgets on Beacon Hill, they were even more delighted. So the voters in the 4th Berkshire District, which is over 20 towns, almost two dozen, will have two choices, uh, two opportunities to cast their vote for a fair budget. I'm proud to be part of that and proud to work with uh, Pat Solomon on that effort. Thank you very much. Uh, next up we have a friend from Holyoke, Holyoke City, City Councilor Aaron Vega, who is also running for state rep. Honored to be up here uh, with all the state reps and congressmen, uh, so I'll be brief. Uh, I'm excited to be here representing Hoyoke because, uh, as you all know, Hoyoke is on the rise, and I think that it's time that Hoyoke is represented once again as part of the valley. Um, what this budget for all does is it sends a strong message to legislators, both at the state level and the national level, as to what the priorities are. And I think that this is important, even though you've already heard that, because there's often that lack of communication for us as constituents to let our legislators know what we're interested in. Um, you hear a lot of talk about taxing the rich and doing this and doing that. I think those are all things that need to be talked about because we need to start talking about a long-term tax plan that's fair, equitable, and sustainable, not just for next year, but for five years and 10 years down the road, which is exactly what this plan starts to do. We need to stop creating budgets that are for votes start creating budgets that will get people elected, and start creating budgets that are going to fix this country and fix the state. Yeah. I believe that this is a great plan because it starts to create smart spending, reinvest in education, reinvest in infrastructure. I think what I've seen over my lifetime is probably the worst thing that this country has done, is create healthcare, education, and trash as profitable entities. And I think that's a total nation. 
I just want to add a couple things to what you heard today. These are our values of community, but also I think of humanity. When we talk about this as a bigger scope, this is not just about us in Massachusetts, even though we like to always think it's about us, don't we? But um, it's about humanity on a whole. I think that this is about reinvesting not only the money here, but reinvesting the money across the country so that we can start creating jobs across this country once again, start making things here once again, and supporting local economies. And then I'd like to just end by saying that these tax dollars not only save lives, as what was said earlier, but enhances lives. We need to make sure we have a strong safety net. That's very important, but we need to make sure we have the path for people to get out of that safety net, to get the job created, to get the job training, to get the education, and to get the health care that they need. So very proud to represent Hoyoke here tonight, and uh, look forward to working with all of you to uh, work on this and other great things here for the Valley. So thank yeah. you all. So next up, we have from the 3rd Hampshire District, uh, Representative Ellen Story. Good evening. We can't see you very well. Mm -hmm. You're sitting over there because the lights are in our eyes, but I can see you better now. Uh, I'm sorry to be late tonight. I was helping the Pelham Lions Club celebrate their 30th anniversary at the Blue Bonnet Diner. <laughs> which was very successful. Um, to hear Joe Comerford talk about the differences in these plans is so stark. It, it almost sounds like a cartoon. No one could really support this plan that Congressman Ryan is in favor of. The budget for all is as far as I'm concerned, complete common sense. It's spending money on the things that we are obligated to spend money on. It's investing in the future. It's investing in our people. It is utter common sense. And I am so afraid if I wake up on November 7th and the wrong people have won. I fear for us. I fear for all of us. I fear for my six and three quarters year old granddaughter and the rest of us. So I am hoping so much that that does not happen. I served with Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is not interested, is not interested he wants to play the part of a governor, but he's not that interested. He, we have very few Republican legislators when he was governor. He didn't even know their names. They disliked him intensely. And when Scott Brown, I served with him in the House as well, and then when he moved to the Senate, the only time that he came to the State House was when we had a roll call vote. That's the only time your constituents know whether you are there or not. And when he was there, he was up in his office doing a real estate closing. He was not paying attention. He's not interested. So. We all, we have until Wednesday to register everybody who needs to be registered. Uh, and we all need to do everything we can so that we can work toward, we have a chance of working toward something like a budget for all. Did any of you read in the paper about the Dalai Lama being in Boston? He just spoke. Um, at a big Boston hotel, and he said wonderful, wonderful things uh, that I wish we could follow. They all are in line with the budget for all. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Representative Peter Coca, who uh, I believe this year makes it a decade representing the 1st Hampshire District. Feel old. Um, 
Let me first of all say welcome um, to the paradise of Massachusetts. Um, many of my colleagues uh, always say how fortunate I am that I represent Northampton. And it's true, but it's not, not only because you know, we have great natural resources and a vibrant uh, town and great things happening all the time, but uh, I am blessed that I have great mentors here. And uh, I count among them Joe Comerford, uh, Archie Markham, uh, Tim Carpenter, Packy Whelan, Francis Crow. Who have I left out? Um, where did Packy, Frank? I, 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 there's, there's, there's lots of mentors there. And in fact, uh, Francis Crow and Packy and I, with, with, a, with a group of people, actually got passed a resolution in the Massachusetts legislature, which Ellen Story voted for, um, asking Congress to shut down Vermont Yankee. Um, and I think we did it on a day where people were preoccupied with other things and it went through and you know, it, it actually happened. So the Massachusetts legislature is on record asking, asking Congress and asking Washington to really just, you know, stop the things that are happening up there. So, um, what I'm going to do tonight is sort of compress the history from December uh, 2007 to today into a few bits of information. And what I'd also like to do is sort of, much like that um, fellow from Austria that just jumped 24,000 feet through the stratosphere and landed safely, um, I'm going to go from a very high altitude view of this to take me really quickly right down into the weeds to sort of explain how Ellen and I and our colleagues dealt with the 47 months of financial freefall that we had to deal with. And we were handled, handed a $3 billion deficit. And so let me describe sort of some of the things that we've done and then let me, let me explain just a few of the challenges that we faced as a Commonwealth leading into January of 2013. Um, First of all, this public policy question that, that we're talking about tonight really has very little to argue with. Um, later on tonight, we can talk about life after the wars in the context of Congress's uh, next moves on cuts in taxes. Um, so let me explain sort of what the Massachusetts example uh, is in terms of dealing with these sorts of crises. There are five basic parts. Cuts, reorganize, reform, save, and capitalize on the good stuff. First of all, we made broad cuts to save those programs that were the most critical. And this process never stops, by the way. As I said, we were faced with a $3 billion shortfall. In fact, this, this year, we've continued this process of analysis. We passed a new law which mandates that every state agency pursue performance-based audits on all of their, their programs, making sure that we keep what works and change those programs that are not productive. This process will carry over into performance audits of tax breaks next year. We've improved our transparency of and access to our government programs so that the public can easily navigate regulatory mandates and state resource opportunities. Second, we made systematic far-reaching changes to our pension system, health care laws, ethics, lobbying, and transportation laws, literally saving billions of dollars over the next 10 years. And there's tons of research showing that that number is probably conservative. Thirdly, we prudently used one-time funding such as stimulus funds, the ARRA funds, and capital gains proceeds. Most of the ARRA funds went into construction projects, and our stabilization fund is now close to $1.5 billion, and we are one of only a handful of states that have a stabilization fund of that magnitude. Fourth, we have concentrated on promoting and expanding those knowledge-based sectors that have created greater job growth in our state than in any other state except Texas. Biotech, precision manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, green jobs, healthcare, and higher ed. This has led to a robust export market and large investments in public and private R&D in our colleges and private companies. Fifth, we have promoted a well-trained workforce. 39% of our population has a bachelor's or higher, which is more than most states and directly translates into a higher wage base. All of the large bond rating agencies on Wall Street, Standard & Poor's, Fitch's, and Moody's have acknowledged these measures and successes by raising our bond rating to A++, in contrast to most states that have seen their bond ratings downgraded during this 
during this period of time. This makes it cheaper for us to borrow money, freeing up funds for additional programming or infrastructure needs. What are our challenges right now? We have many, but let me concentrate on a couple. When you look at that job growth that I just talked about, it is not balanced geographically or, around, or, or along skill levels or job groups. For example, Lowell and Lawrence have an 11.2% unemployment rate. Fall River and New Bedford, 9.8%. And the areas of North Adams and Pittsfield, Springfield, Holyoke, and Fitchburg, Lemonster are not far behind and are not sharing the same job growth seen in the greater Boston area. Outside of healthcare and high tech, most job postings that you see are either for part time work or seasonal work. Our recovery, therefore, is, has been termed fragile and uneven, according to both UMass Amherst and the Fed Bank of Boston. Businesses, by and large, are spending on replenishing stocks and are investing in productivity enhancing products and services and less on personnel. In 2007, Massachusetts was home to 1,300. 137,000 construction workers. In 2010, that number is 100,800. That's a drop of 22%. In Western Massachusetts, in this valley, it's estimated that over 30% of building trades workers are unemployed. Construction, traditional manufacturing, and consumer sensitive sectors continue to underperform. From 2005 to 2010, housing prices fell by 13.7%. As of last year, it's estimated that 15% of all homeowners were underwater on their mortgages. Those traditional paths to the middle class through blue collar jobs has suffered disproportionately during the past five years. In June of this year, 438,000 Massachusetts residents reported being unemployed or underemployed. Among post 9-11 veterans, 10% of those veterans that are men are unemployed, 13% of women veterans are unemployed. Our Commonwealth Job Creation Commission put out its recommendations on October 3rd of this year. These include goals of capitalizing on our well-educated workforce as our greatest natural resource, building up the capacity of our public colleges to educate, train, and attract uh, new research dollars, and to overcome employment barriers for those seeking to compete in the modern world marketplace. We need to bring new opportunities to those regions that have not seen adequate job growth. This report also concentrates on the so-called middle skill workers and recommends a better coordinated system of workforce training and job search, resource, job search resources and will be complemented by the $5 million recently passed by the legislature for this purpose and $50 million passed the job creation bill that my colleagues and I voted on last year. We've also included a $1 million pipeline fund to train interns at technology companies. Um, I'm sure that our, our congressman is going to be talking about what's happening in Washington in a minute, and I'd be happy to answer questions after that time. Thank you. He is representative of Massachusetts' third congressional district. Uh, and there's a rumor that he will actually be representing this city sometime next year. He's been a consistently progressive member of Congress who voted notably in 2002 to oppose the invasion of Iraq, particularly for, particularly for Representative Lee's ill-fated but admirable amendment to avoid the war. He has voted for the budget for all. It is my pleasure to introduce Representative McGovern. Jeff, and um, uh, thank you for that very generous introduction and, um, and for all that you do in organizing this. And all the organizers, I want to thank you for putting this together tonight. Uh, I want to acknowledge our great mayor of Northampton, uh, David Nakowitz, who is uh, one of the best mayors we have in this country. And I want to thank Joe Comerford for her very, uh, I think, easy to understand but right to the point uh, presentation. Woo! Langonor, well, good luck, um, and uh, Aaron, Aaron Bay, who I'm getting to know on the campaign trail, he'll yeah. make one hell of a state rep. So yeah. Yeah, make sure you help him out. And um, to Ellen Story and Peter Kokai, I mean, I, uh, I'll tell you, they're two of the most compassionate and brightest public servants that I have ever encountered, and I, 
I tell you, 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 you elect some really good people out here. Uh, <laughs> people who, uh, who understand <laughs> what the issues are. And, uh, and I, uh, I'm, I'm, it's going to be a real privilege to serve alongside of them. They should be, they should be running for Congress, not me. Um, let me, uh, it's tough to be the last speaker. I, I don't know how many of you remember the uh, late uh, Congressman Mo Udall of Arizona. Great, great man. I get to know him a little bit. But he used to say, uh, when he was the last speaker after a string of really wonderful speakers, he used to say, everything that possibly can be said has been said, but not everybody has said it. And I kind of figured that I'd fall into that category a little bit here. So if, if I re repeat some of what you've heard, I hope, you, I hope you'll forgive me. Let me let me begin by saying, I, again, I, it really is a privilege to be here. And I have a feeling I'm in a room of troublemakers. Um, and uh, I am too. And so I am. I'm really happy to be with you. Uh, but we're also patriots. Uh, and what motivates us to be here on a kind of chilly, rainy night uh, in a, this auditorium, high school auditorium, is that we love this country. Uh, and we believe that this country uh, can be better. Uh, and that is, to me, uh, a form of patriotism. And when people who see bad things happening sit back and say nothing, uh, to me, that's cowardice. Uh, and it is really important, especially during these difficult times, as some very dramatic choices are being made, both at the state level and at the federal level, that people be engaged. This is your country. This is our country. Uh, we all have a responsibility. Uh, and we need to spread the knowledge that is uh, being imparted in this session here uh, to other people and to other communities. That is why this referendum is so important. Because I believe the change um, the kind of change we're talking about with the budget for all is probably not going to happen from Washington uh, alone. It is going to be it's going to happen because the grassroots, the people of this country, are going to make their voices heard and say enough is enough. It is time to change direction. It is time to put our priorities uh, in order. And you know, Jeff, I want to agree with something Jeff said in, in the beginning. You know, I believe that budgets federal budgets and state budgets and city budgets, they're moral documents. They really are. I mean, they, they tell us what we think is important. You know, they, 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 they tell what we value, um, you know, what our priorities are, what we care about. And when you have budgets that routinely uh, turn a cold shoulder to the poor in this country, you know, make it more difficult for the middle class, Provide big tax cuts to the wealthy and to big corporations, uh, and, and you know, and continue to overinvest in a military budget that is so big that even Doctor Strangelove would be impressed. You got to wonder what the hell is going on, because I don't believe that the budgets coming out of Washington reflect what the majority in this country believe, and not just Democrats, but I think even in Republicans. I don't. I, I can't believe that this country. Uh, has moved down the path uh, where Paul Ryan wants to take us. Um, a budget that really epitomizes greed and selfishness. Uh, it's cruel. It would, it would create a government that lacks a conscience. Uh, I don't believe that even my Republican friends um, who I serve with really quite understand what his budget would do to this country. Uh, and that's not an America that I want to see. Um, I, 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 you know, I, again, I, I you know, I've got the privilege of, of serving in Congress since 1996. Uh, and I've met, you know, countless people. And uh, I've had people come into my office who have enjoyed great success, and I've cheered them on. And I've had people come into my office who live out of their automobiles. I've had people come into their, my office looking for food, uh, looking for direction to the closest food bank or food pantry, trying to figure out how they're going to feed their kids. You know, we have tens of millions of people in the United States of America who are hungry, who are hungry. As a congressman, I'm ashamed of that fact. I, I, I think everybody should be ashamed of that fact. We're the richest, most powerful country in the world, and nobody, and absolutely nobody in this country should go hungry. Food ought to be a right, just like healthcare ought to be a right. Uh,